in that that first verse, placing my hand the wonderful key. In the context of the, the scripture being open, that we might be able to see the truth kind of goes along with our study. And I'm not sure if we're going to get to it this morning or not. Hopefully we will. About the keys uh, of the kingdom that was given to the church. But we want to continue our study and our thoughts that we began last Sunday morning in Matthew the 16th chapter verse 13 through verse 20 when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi he asked his disciples saying whom do men say that I the son of man am and they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. <coughs> he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so we established that there were certain questions then that we needed to answer. Uh, concerning these verses, if we are to rightly understand them. And in our first uh, study in this uh, ecclesiology, or the study of the church, we covered the first two questions that we set forth. That is question number one, who or what is the rock upon which Jesus would build his church? And that, of course, is Jesus himself is that rock. The second question was the meaning and nature of the term Ecclesia, which, he des which described what Jesus said he was going to build. And that is a called out assembly or congregation, a local visible assembly of scripturally baptized believers coming it together. So today we want to look at the next question on our list, question number three then. What did Jesus mean when he said the gates of hell would not prevail against his ecclesia or church, which was to be built upon the rock of himself? Now the phrase, as we see there in verse 18, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is an important promise that Jesus made here uh, concerning his church. The gates of hell refer to the idea of death, of Sheol, Hades, the place of departed spirits. And one of the things that we see here that, you know, his church is an institution. It is not just an individual. And it's not just a certain group of individuals, but his institution, which will continue on in perpetuity from generation to generation. But he says, death will not overtake it. Death will not swallow it up. And one of the reasons that we, we see for this is that he is the rock upon which his church is built. And death could not hold him. Death did not prevail on him. When he went to the cross, he died for our sins. He said, now no man takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own self. And I'll take it up again of my own self. And so he went to the cross. He gave his 
life. He laid it down. He, they took his body down off the cross. They placed it in a tomb and sealed it. There the body remained for three days and nights, 72 hours in the uh, tomb. And then he arose, as he said he would, according to the scriptures. He arose. Death has no power over him. The grave could not hold him. He conquered sin, death, and the grave, and hell itself on our behalf. Now, if the grave could not hold him, if death could not prevail against him, and he is the foundation upon which his church is built, and the uh, verb there, I will build my church, is a in the Greek, it's a linear verb. It shows continuous action. It's not just talking about the idea that he would establish it and turn it loose, but he continues to oversee its functions on a continual basis. He's the head of his church. Jesus Christ, if you will, he is the member and the head of each and every one of his congregations. He is present with them. And so, because he lives, he continues, then so will his church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Um, we see that the word there, I will build, literally in the Greek it denotes, I have already begun to build, I am building, and I will continue to build my church. And so, as we look at some uh, statements then, Acts chapter 2, verse 41, after the resurrection and ascension of Christ into heaven, we see on the day of Pentecost the, the church present and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is speaking here, the preaching to all of these people present. In verse 41, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. The same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people of the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. No, the Lord, the Lord added to the church daily. So it was a continuing thing. I have begun to build. I am building. I will continue to build my church because the gates of hell could not prevail against him. Neither can they prevail against his body here on the earth, which is his church. Now again, uh, as we noted uh, last time, Sometimes we refer to the church in its generic or institutional sense, but it only finds its actual fulfillment in each individual case where there is a location, where there is a body of believers gathered together in his name. Um, and so we see here in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, And the Apostle Paul speaking here, whom he says of himself, and God had given him wisdom as a wise master builder. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18 says, But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. And so he's continuing to build his church. Uh, we see in verse 28, God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles and gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, and so on. But God has set some in the church, that is, he's established certain offices in the church, and he started with the apostles. And so when he uh, gathered his disciples together 
And out of those disciples, he chose 12 whom he named apostles. The church was already present. He'd already begun to build his church. And now he's setting in that church the office of the apostles. And that was the first office he established. And later pastors and so on. As we see the Lord added. Uh, the Lord uh, here uh, placed them in his church. Uh, he set them, the members... Uh, he sets officers in the church. He set the members. He set officers in the church. So he is building. And he continues to this day. Now, with that said, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20, here and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone and are built and that what Jesus said I will build my church and so Paul here writing years later after the death, burial, resurrection, after the ascension of the Lord, after Pentecost. We see in Paul's words a continuing fulfillment of that which Jesus said in Matthew 16, I will build my church. He's still doing it. He sets the members in the church. When people are saved, who are saved by the grace of God. Salvation is the Lord. He's saving them. And when they're added to the church, He's the one that's adding them. Through the leadership of the Holy Spirit as people obey uh, the Scriptures and follow the Lord in scriptural baptism, and then they come and are added, they join a, a New Testament church. Yeah, they come and present themselves. We vote to receive them, but in doing so, we're following the Lord's commands. It's the Lord who is adding them. He's placing them in the church. He's setting them there. Oh, he calls men into the ministry, and churches call these men as pastors. But if the pastor is seeking the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the church is seeking the leadership of the Holy Spirit, and they are in agreement, it's the Lord who set them in the church. They are built. Each and every one. As we see there in, in Ephesians. Whom all the building or each or several building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord. Jesus Christ, who died for our sins and arose victorious over death and the grave, now reigns at the right hand of the throne of God in heaven and continuously is building his church or his congregations. So since death did not prevail over him and cannot prevail against his church, his congregations, which are founded upon the rock of Jesus Christ himself, So there is this spiritual component where an habitation of God, each church is a habitation of God through the Spirit. It is the Spirit who is the comforter who comes alongside, and, he, and the idea of the comforter is the paraclete. It's, it's translated comforter. But the idea of the paraclete or comforter is one who comes alongside. And not only to comfort us, but to strengthen us, to teach us, to guide us, to bring back into remembrance the Scripture, and to guide us to all truth. This is part of the work of the Holy Spirit. And this spiritual component of each body, as a body of Christ, indwelt by God's Spirit, a habitation of God through the Spirit, through the teaching of His Word and the Holy Spirit working uh, both to give a, a knowledge and a right understanding
understanding to, to speak forth and, and, and giving you, uh, as we sing, you know, the, the illumination of your mind and, and your understanding to receive God's Word. God is teaching and building up and strengthening His churches as well. And so this spiritual component is not just man. It's not a man-made institution. It's a, a spiritual institution ordained of God. It has it, its human elements as each of us as living stones are being fitly framed together. But it is God who is doing the fitly framing together. It is God who is setting every member in the church. It is God who is setting a, a certain offices in the church and, and calling men and, and all to fulfill those offices and so on. And since he ever liveth. You see, when we consider it from that standpoint, it only makes sense that death would never be able to prevail over his church, that his church would never cease to exist and to function until he comes back for it. As long as he lives, as long as he's the head of his church, as long as His Spirit still indwells His churches and still seals uh, his, his people, how can man or even Satan prevail to bring His church to naught? And yet, the majority, the vast majority of Christianity today their concept of the church is founded upon the very precept that his church failed and ceased to exist and had to be reorganized, had to be reformed. Not so. Not according to Matthew, not according to Jesus' own proclamation here in Matthew the 16th chapter. Um, uh, in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 21, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Not everybody can say amen to that because they don't believe that. Paul, that the master builder, Paul, and had made the earlier statements that we quoted said unto him, that is unto God the Father, be the glory. Where? In his church. By Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ, the head of his church, the foundation of his church, the chief cornerstone of his church, whoever liveth, sitting at the right hand of the throne of God in heaven, making intercession for us, continues to build his <coughs> church. He says throughout all ages. That includes the dark ages. Now Satan has attempted obviously to destroy his church. He has created a counterfeit church. You know, and it's kind of like when Satan came to Eve in the garden, half God said, did Jesus really mean his church would never die out? Did he really mean that it would continue just as he established it through all ages? Did he really say that? Yes, he did. But Satan would have us question that. And then when we would question that, then he would substitute his version for the truth. But it's a lie. See, his version of the truth acknowledges his counterfeit church as the church of Jesus Christ. His counterfeit church was the Catholic church. Now, the counterfeit church it says Peter was the rock upon which the church was built. The Satan's counterfeit church says that God
God gave the keys, the authority to Peter. And Peter passed them down to his successors, that is the bishops of the Church of Rome. It's a counterfeit church. The Catholic Church did not come into existence. The earliest that we can date it would be around 320 A.D. when Constantine gathered the apostate churches together and made them the official church of Rome. And note, he, Constantine, became the head of the Catholic Church. Jesus Christ is not the head of the Catholic Church in 320 A.D. Constantine and those apostate bishops accepted that. Those apostate churches accepted a pagan, heathen ruler as the head of their churches. That is not the church that Jesus built. Never was, never will be. Cannot be. But that is the lie that Satan has convinced people to believe. And so they trace their history down through the dark ages through the Catholic Church. And when we come to the time of the Reformation, And then even people within the Catholic Church are saying, wait a minute, this is wrong. This is not the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But how did they know that? Because there was a group of Christians all through this time that opposed Rome, that never submitted to Rome. Just like Jesus said, throughout all ages, that included the Dark Ages. That included the time when Rome was at the zenith of its power and persecuted the true churches and sought to destroy them. Even pre we hear about the crusades that went over to Jerusalem. Before that, there was crusades against Christian churches, against the Albigenses, against the Waldenses, southern France, northern Italy. Those, those are some crusades too, but you don't read about those so much in history. But that's where the old dragon sought to destroy the church that Jesus built. But Jesus is still alive. He's still on the throne. The gates of hell did not prevail against him, and they have not prevailed against his church. Catholic church cannot rightly claim to be the church Jesus built, as we have pointed out. Not only were they founded upon a man, on the doctrine, man's doctrine, uh, but many other false teachings and practices as well. The Protestant churches cannot rightly claim to be the church that Jesus built because their church is founded upon the very premise that the church died out, apostatized, and into the Roman Catholic Church, and therefore had to be reformed. And they separated from it and, and started over, but they did not have scriptural baptism. They did not have scriptural ordinations. They themselves said that the church at Rome was a false church, was an apostate church. Then, well, how can their baptism be valid then? How can their ordinations be valid? How can they start? And so they had to redefine the church. Rome had redefined it into a universal visible king, uh, church, equating the church with the kingdom. The Protestant movement had to redefine the church then as a universal invisible church, uh, making it the same as the family of God, and, and therefore saying that the true church was hidden within the false church down through those ages, and as the same people came out, uh, in the Reformation, and they made up the true church today, and so on. But that's not what Jesus said. There's not two churches. There's not a visible church and then an invisible spiritual church. He said there's one body. There's one church. 
Likewise, the Mormon Church or Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they believe that Smith had to reorganize a new church for the old ones lost. None of which matches the pattern of the New Testament. And we compare all these to the teachings of the New Testament. They all come short. Nor the promise of perpetuity that Jesus gave to his church. The very kind of church or congregation founded by Christ in the New Testament has remained functioning as established by Christ, holding and exercising the keys given to them to this day. Which brings us to the next two questions that we want to uh, kind of cover together. He says in verse 9, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What are the keys that Jesus referred to here? And what is the power of the possessor of the keys has, uh, that is, to bind and loose. What does that mean? This is not the authority as to who can enter into heaven. Again, Catholicism. And you see how this has permeated the mindset of, of our whole society when it comes to these things. See, their teaching, well, the church was founded upon Peter, and God gave Peter the keys. How many jokes have you heard about the person who died and went to heaven and met Peter who was staying there at the gates? That's based upon the, this Catholicism and their false interpretation and teaching of the church, the keys. They said, see, Peter, he has the keys. He gets to say who can get into heaven and who can't. They have to pass his muster. That's what all those jokes, all those stories are founded upon. You know, they get to heaven, they get to the pearly gates, who they see? They see Peter. And not the, they don't see the Lord Jesus Christ. They see Peter. Why? Because he's got the keys. He can unlock the gate and let you in if you pass his muster. That's, that's not what it's talking about. But, but you, you see how insidious that idea has permeated even jokes that the ungodly tell. Satan is subtle. His lie is accepted almost without question, without challenge. So what are the keys? Well, the keys do speak to us of authority of power. And when he said, I give unto thee, will give unto thee the keys. I will give unto thee the keys. The kingdom of heaven. He wasn't talking just Peter. Because remember, you go back, what piece? He said, we're all just living stones. I'm just one pebble. I'm just one stone in making up this building, this spiritual temple unto the Lord. It is to that institution, the church, that he gave the keys. And keys speak to us of authority. And it's not the authority as who is going to get into heaven and who doesn't. But the authority to judge matters between brethren. Now, notice verse 19. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Look in chapter 18. Chapter 18, he is instructing them as to how to deal with a situation where there is an offense between brethren. And it goes through the steps. And the steps were, you know, if a brother uh, 
Christian has offended you, you need to go to that person in private and tell them their fault, tell them what it was that they did that offended you, why it offended you, and seek reconciliation in private. And if that person will not be reconciled, will not apologize or whatever, and you can't get it reconciled, then he says, okay, then you go and you get two or three witnesses. Because it's established from the Old Testament all the way through. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, a matter will be established. And so you get two or three witnesses and you go back and, and they will act to help um, hear both sides and to offer their advice and give instruction as to what should be done. Maybe it's the first person that was offended that needs to back off. You know, in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Maybe they, you know. But with, before these witnesses, hearing both sides and, and offering their counsel, if it can be reconciled there, then that is the end of it. It goes no further. Make sure the people that you choose to go with you as witnesses can keep their mouth shut because it, it doesn't need to be told that beyond that. If it's reconciled, it's over and it's done with. But if you still can't get it settled, now you have witnesses. He says, bring it to the church. Bring it before the church. Why? Because that's whom God has given the keys to. They have authority. They have the authority to judge these matters according to the Word of God. That is, not just according to the Word of God they have the authority, but they have authority to take the Word of God and make a godly decision based on what God has commanded. <laughs> and then he said, but if they won't hear the church, let him be unto thee, that is, the believers there, the church, as a heathen man and a publican. Verse 17. In verse 18, Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth. So here, in this next two chapters over, Jesus gives an example of what binding and loosing refers to. It was church action, church decision, discipline. They heard a matter. They had two or three witnesses. The church pronounced its judgment. One person was not willing to accept the judgment of the church and that person was to be put out. There would be no division, no schism, no offense. And here Jesus equates that to the binding and loosing that he mentioned in chapter 16. The Gospel of John uses a different terminology. He says, whosoever sins you shall remit, shall be remitted them. And whosoever sins you retain, shall be retained unto them. Now, let us go back for a moment to the idea of this, the verb, binding. Binding and loose. Uh, again, in the Greek has different forms that have different twists of meaning to them and this idea and it translates into the English but uh, not necessarily word for word, just one word for one word basically in the English what it means is whatsoever you bind on earth shall have already been bound in heaven and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall have already been loosed in heaven in other words, we're to judge according to God's judgment. What he has already pronounced. See, we do not have authority to make new laws. We do not have the authority to just 
whatever we want to do. Our authority to act in His name by His authority is to do that which He has authorized us to do, that which He's already given us to do. And so that which He has pronounced sin, we're to pronounce sin. You know, and he said, Mosh, if a, if a person's offended you and you go to them and, and, and you, you rebuke them and they repent, then you accept their apology. You accept that repentance and you forgive them their sins. That's what he's taught. So when a situation comes up, a brother gets rebuked, he repents, you forgive them. That's according to the scripture. And so if since you remit, they're remitted to them. You forgive them. But if they don't repent, if in our judgment, that's where spiritual discernment is so important. If in our spiritual discernment and understanding, the person has not repented, then we're not obligated to accept their apology and forgive them. Whosoever sins you retain shall be retained unto them. And so the admonitions uh, that Paul said there in the scripture, you know, this here's this person, said, you're not doing well, you kept this person, he's guilty of this very gross sin, that even the Gentiles, he wrote there in, in 1 Corinthians, his letter to the 1 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, he said, now I've already judged what you should do with this person. You need to exclude them. You need to put them out. You know, they have sinned and they're not, you know, you're encouraging them to continue in sin. You're making it okay for them to continue in sin. And so they exclude this person. Well, in his second epistle, he says, now, you know, you, you've cleared yourselves, but this person has repented. Now you need to receive them back. Those are the types of things as you see them uh, carried out in the scriptures that define and help define for us what the keys, the authority means. And in Matthew, the, the 28th chapter, we see some other things specifically mentioned here. In verse 18, chapter 28, Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power or authority is given to me. Now, what did he say? He said, I will, I will give these keys to you. And here's where he's doing it. He said, all authority, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. Oh, he's sending us forth in his name, to act in his name, under his authority. Now, Lou has pointed out several times we're talking about nursing and, and certain situations that when you're uh, working under say there's an RN on a case and you're an LPN or a CNA and they tell you to do something you're doing it under her license you're acting under her authority she has the authority to uh, do those things. You don't. But if she tells you to do it and you're doing it under her supervision, you're doing it under her license. Jesus says, I have all the power and the authority. And I'm sending you forth and I'm telling you to do these things. You don't have the authority apart from me to do it. But when you do it operating under my license, under my authority, you know, go ye therefore. And so what he said, we're to evangelize. The church is given the commission to evangelize. Not just to evangelize, but to make disciples. And there is a di distinction between. We're to make disciples. Now any, I, I believe that any saved person, uh, they, they've heard the gospel they have a responsibility to share the gospel. 
how to be saved with someone else. The Lord may use that. But just getting someone saved is not making a disciple. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciple indeed. Not just when you believe on me, he said, but when you continue in my word. And so the commission here to the church is to make disciples. We are to, by these steps, make and, and mature, well, make, mark, and mature, if you will, that was somebody's outline, disciples. And we make them through evangelizing, we mark them through the ordinance of baptism, and we mature them through the teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. That coincides with Jesus. Now, when you continue in my work, then you're my disciples indeed. So the keys involve the authority to evangel to make disciples by evangelizing, baptizing, teaching, them to observe. Paul made the observation. Uh, in the book of Acts, we made the observation where when they, they preached, people were saved. They were baptized. As many as gladly received his word were baptized. And there was added unto them 3,000 souls. And they continued in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and so on. They're in church capacity. They were added to the church. And they continued in church capacity in those things because that's the keys. And, and he taught them. Paul, writing to Timothy, talked about the church, that uh, how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. We have been given the authority to teach the truth, to teach God's word. To pass on from generation to generation. This is one of the ways in which he perpetuates his church. It is not it, it, it is not it's unusual to notice that false churches do not have the truth when it comes to the church. It makes sense. The only one that is going to have the truth concerning the church are true New Testament churches. They're the pillar and the ground of the truth. And they have continued to teach all the counsel of God down through all ages. And through them, the church has been perpetuated. Now, I don't expect a Catholic to church to teach the truth on the church. They're not a true church to start with. They never had that truth. God never gave them the keys to that. You know, there are some churches, they may preach the gospel. But they don't have the authority to scripturally baptize. They do not have the authority to ordain. They do not have the authority to teach all things and teach people to observe. And what they are teaching men to observe are the doctrines of men, not the doctrine that Christ instituted in his church. And so, uh, the authority to act in his name is given to each local church. Each local church possesses the key to act in his name. Verb two of the have been gathered together in my name, and they're authorized to act in my name. And it's what they, they agree upon. You know, the authority to bind and loose in his name. And so to teach them to observe all things whatsoever he has commanded us. Again, there's that binding, that which he has already commanded us. 
We have the authority to act on that and to carry that out. And because he is present, he ever liveth. He is still the head of his church. He is still building his church. His spirit is still present in his church. That's the reason it has continued down through all ages. He has preserved it. You know, it's like us as an individual. We'll persevere. Why? Because God preserves us. The two go together. The perseverance of the saints and the preservation of the saints. Again, like two sides of the same coin. We will persevere because God is keeping us. We're kept by the power of God through faith. His church will persevere. He has promised to perpetuate His church. So His church will persevere and continue because He ever liveth to preserve it and to perpetuate it. As He has promised to do. I believe those promises have been literally fulfilled through those New Testament Baptist churches who down through the ages have earnestly contended for the faith and who continue to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Nothing new. Nothing added to it, nothing taken away from it, but that faith that was once delivered to the saints. And that includes all things whatsoever he has commanded us. The truth concerning the gospel. Salvation by grace through faith. That not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. True New Testament Baptist churches have preserved the truth of the gospel down through the ages in the face of persecution and every attempt by Satan to destroy the Lord's church and to destroy that gospel and to preach another gospel, to preach another Jesus. Not only that, but preserve the doctrine of scriptural baptism. That's the immersion of believer in water on profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And evidence of that new birth, that they're immersed in the likeness of His burial and raised up in the likeness of His resurrection to walk in newness of life. Truth concerning the Lord's New Testament church and, and all the other things, the, the discipline and the observance of the Lord's Supper and the ordination uh, of men to carry on that work through these means and God's presence and oversight of those functions. We have, the Lord has perpetuated His church down to this present time. So it's not bragging upon ourselves that we make those claims that only Baptist churches have continued from the time of Christ to this present time. But Jesus Christ is our head. We have no headquarters here on earth. We have no head here on earth. Our head is the Lord Jesus Christ. The head of this church is the Lord Jesus Christ. We acknowledge no other head, no other authority, no other leadership than Him. We have no headquarters here on earth, no other organization outside of this church that we must answer to. We believe that each church is a local autonomous body or congregation under the headship of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is merely an exalting of the Lord and His power and, and believing that He that which he said, that which he's promised, he is able to do and has performed just like he said. It's not bragging what men have done, it's bragging what the Lord has done. Our boast is in the Lord, not in ourselves. It is no glory to me that I'm a Baptist or that I believe these things and hold these things. But like he said, Peter, he just a little fellow. Flesh and blood hadn't revealed this to you of my Father which is in heaven. See, it's no glory to us, but all the glory 
belongs to him. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I have given to thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. We ought not to take those keys for granted. It is a great responsibility, and actually a responsibility we'll be exercising tonight. Tonight is our monthly business meeting, and that's what we're doing. We're exercising the keys of the kingdom of heaven that have been given to us to act in his name on those matters that are brought before this ecclesia, this deliberative body, this congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us stand together.